And I didn't want that, that, that money that, you know, that, that money that was going to cost me my life. Because my grandmother told me, when your past catch up with you, it's going to be hard than what you have done to people in the past. All right, man, we back again for another Beneview interview. Today, we got somebody special. We got a Mac Town legend. Legend. If you see his face, you know he don't need no introductions. You already know who we got with us today, Mr. Nathan Williams. How you doing, my good I'm friend? Doing fine. Doing Papa. Fine. I know him as Papa. Papa. <laughs> yes, sir. All right, so, man, we're going to get into the interview, slide in there. Tell us a little bit a little bit about yourself. You born and raised in McKinney? McKinney, Texas, one and only. Yeah, how was that growing up? Man, it was how, how was man. you as a child? It, it was wonderful. I, I, I enjoyed, you know, just coming up as a child in McKinney because it was much love show. You know, McKinney was just like, like the village, man. Everybody was somebody, mother and father there. Yeah. What was the typical street you ran around? Oh, rock wild, bumpers. Uh, pretty much just through McKinney. You know, I was like a savage, man, just through McKinney. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, how was you as a kid? Was you just like to yourself? Was you always with the crowd? Was you, how was you as a kid? Pretty much coming from a big family of 11 of us at that particular time. Um, just, man, just, just trying to survive out there, you know. Mother was working, father, you know, wasn't there at the time. And so, we had to do what we had to do. Yeah. You know, coming up as a kid, so we had to learn the streets and learn how how to make it and get it fast before yeah. people was getting it. Yeah. Wow. yeah uh, what uh, child are you? You the oldest, youngest? No, oh no, I'm pretty much the uh, probably the seventh, the eighth child. Okay. Okay. Oh wow. Okay. I didn't know that. How many boys? How many girls? It's four boys and uh, the rest girls. Ooh. Oh we. How was it uh, growing up in a house full of women like that? Well, man, you know, like I say, back then, you very protective of the girls. Right. You know, being sisters and stuff, you had protected. Because so much was going on back then, just like it was now. But we pretty much, you know, we, we was close-knit. We, we looked out for each other. Yeah. You know, coming from, you know, being poor and stuff, you know, we just, you know, looked out for each other. Yeah. Did you know y'all was poor at the time, or that was just how life was? Uh, Pretty much, yeah, you know. Pretty much, I, I did, you know, because when Christmas came around, you could pretty much tell things okay. weren't what they're supposed to be. So Christmas told the story. Okay. You know. Okay. How did you tap into sports? Like, um, when, when you were a boxer? I, you know what? Getting up, being in the streets and uh, going to school, because being in school wasn't one of the things I really liked it at all. And I ran to a Mexican friend of mine by the name of Joe Flores. And his brother was a, a coach in boxing. And then having a friend of mine who's James Kitchen come up in our community, okay. you know, hooked up with them and stuff boxing. So James kind of pulled the all that was out there ripping and running into the game of boxing. And so that's how I got started in that with James and, and Barney Flores and all them. Okay. Were you pretty? Were you any good? Pretty much, I man. I, 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 you know what? I, I can handle. I can, I can handle miles. Okay. <laughs> I, can handle miles I mean, you know what? Be, be honest with you. Most people don't know it. But most boxers get beat up real bad. If you look at me, mm -hmm. I'm just like, you know, I'm not one of the only Ali, man. I, okay, I'm not beat up in the face. Yeah. I mean, I have a mind, so if you came with me, you're going to have to bring it too. So, you know, you have to bring it down. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. So, what was the uh, culture of McKinney like? I, I keep hearing you saying ripping around the streets. What was, like, the culture of McKinney like at the time? Man, the culture of McKinney was, it was, everybody was territorial. You know, you had, you had Rockwall, you had Louisville. You had the run, you had Lively Hill, and you had Central, and everybody came up in in, in, in McKinney. There was all of those names I named. African American people lived in those communities, and so when we got together, you know, we was kind of like colliding. If like, you know, we was at war with each other for some reason. I don't know what 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 that was all about. But we was always fighting each other. Okay, so I was born in '87, and I know growing up in the '90s, it was just like that. So around what time are you talking about? Oh man, we we talking about around the seventies, wow. around about the seventies and stuff. Wow, it go back then. Sixties like and seventies, like sixties and seventies. Okay, wow, generational. 
Generational, yeah. yeah. Exactly what that is. You know, and everybody had, you know, had a nickname, so, you know, and sometimes, you know, you know you was one about the police, you definitely had to have a nickname. Yeah. Yeah. You still got your, you still carry your nickname today? Pretty much people, man, still recognize me as Playmate. Okay. Uh, some of them call me the corporal, you know, because I started a gang, a, a bicycle gang with people, you know, we, people, you know, they laugh out, bicycle gang, man, that's weak. But what they, you know, we pretty much stronger than anybody that was, that was in the gang. We had pistols and, you know, we did our thing. We we stole, we robbed. That's the thing, you know, we did. Yeah. But, you know, what was the name you know, of it? The Black Zodiac. The Black Zodiac. From Kitty, Texas. Okay. Okay. Uh, somebody else mentioned the Black yeah, Zodiac. Yeah, my pops uh, mentioned the Black Zodiac. Black Zodiac. Oh, John John. John John. Shout out John John. Yeah, shout out John John. John John, yeah. John, 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 yeah. John, John yeah. mentioned that. So, I've asked this question before, but let me get your perspective on it. At what point did the gang culture even come to McKinney? For your generation, we just it started because we was you know we was a rivalries against other communities in that in that little town, mm -hmm. and then outside of the town, you know everybody was trying to uh, trying to prove that they were the strongest coming up out of McKinney because you had Plano, Greenville, you had uh, uh, Sherman, you had all these competitive teams that came to play football, play sport, and so when they came up in there, you know it was head busting time. Mm -hmm. And so when we come out, you know, we always wait on everybody, you know, you know, you know, show what they had. So we were gonna show what we had. Yeah. And so that's how it all started. And then to 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 uh, reinforce and build a a a, a, a establishment of a game with, with a club, then we went strong. We went strong where people can match. You know, we was about a hundred and some people strong. Wow. And, wow. And you know, we were, we we would ride our bicycles. You know, like I say, it's funny to people, but at that time, you know, people were. Driving cars and stuff. Then we ride our bicycle our way to Dallas. I mean, we'll take over store if it came down to it. We'll walk in the store at 50, 25 people deep, man. And you couldn't do nothing with us. Okay, how many how many employees you had? You couldn't do nothing with us. And what age was this? We was probably like 16, 17. Wow. Yeah. Wow. How long did that last? It lasts for about two years. Two years. Everybody started growing out of. Doing what they was doing, people start getting caught up in some other things and going to the penitentiary and all that. And so we eventually, you know, got girls that we, you know, start dating and stuff and start getting pregnant. And so we kind of start falling out. Okay. Speaking of pregnancy, when what age did you become a father? Mm, 18. 18? 18. 18. So that was in the heart of the Black Zodiacs. Pretty much. Wow. So how was that becoming... A father and quote unquote being in, I guess you're gonna say a gang, a clique? At first, you know, it, it was something I wasn't really even ready for. But then I began to start accepting because, you know, uh, it, it was a change maker for me. It really was, you know, knowing I'm finna have a kid and stuff and the things that we was doing that we really didn't want mom and them to know what we were doing. We was doing some hard stuff and just being in the gang. And so, uh, I, you know, after seeing my baby, I, I pretty much wanted to pull away from him. I was stealing, robbing, doing what we was doing. So you knew at, at that point the risk you was taking. Yeah. What was the uh, the final moment of Black Zodiac to fatherhood? Um, hmm. Actually... You could just see the change coming, you know. And what I mean by that, even in my family, even just in my immediate family with the sisters and brothers, you just see the changes in the sisters and the brothers and your friends and the mothers and father. Everything was just beginning to change. Time started moving fast and started pulling us with it. And so, you know, if you, unless you were just real slow, you was going to get stuck in time. And I didn't want to get stuck in time. So I'm seeing that was some money that could be made honest. And I wanted to go get that money, you know, that honest money. And I didn't want that, that, that money that, you know, that, that money that was going to cost me my life. Because my grandmother told me, when your past catch up with you, it's going to be hard than what you have done to people in the past. Hmm. So I bailed out. And even being shot was enough for me. Oh, you actually been shot? I've got, I had got shot during that period of time, of the transition of coming out of all of that. Can you tell us about it? Being a hard hit, just like these kids are now, you know, we all grow up thinking we know it all. Um, going against what mama said, don't do, 
and it pretty much almost cost me my life at the age of 17. And uh, I ended up at a place where I shouldn't have even been, you know, at the, they say at the wrong place, at, at, at the wrong place at the wrong time. I shouldn't even been at the place, period. I ended up getting shot at, at, at a club that I shouldn't even been in. And I ended up getting shot by mistaken identity by friends that, uh, that had jumped on a man and the man ended up shooting me behind a mistake, mistaken identity. You say a uh, you say a place that you shouldn't have been. Leading up to going there, did you have like an eerie feeling, or you were just going with the day? Uh, pretty much. No, I, I really did. not I didn't feel nothing was bad was going to happen to me, nothing like that. But then when it started to uh, started playing out, then I knew something was real bad going to happen. I, I I mean I just felt it in. But further than my day, going through my normal day now. How'd you get to the hospital? They end up calling the ambulance to come and get me. Okay. Because, you know, I, I really had passed out on the floor. But um, the only thing I could I could really think about before I got shot, when my grandmother told me, before she passed, she said, your past is going to catch up with me. And that was the only thing played in my mind when this man put this gun out. Those very words came back to my to my memory. Mm. That your past now is here. It's have arrived. But when he shot me, I asked, you know, cause I, I came up as a God fearing young man. And I asked God at that particular time with the little breath I had to forgive me for my sin. And forgive me for going against what my mother told me not to do. And I ended up waking up in the hospital. Mm. Did you know the guy? I knew him, but not like I did my friends. I, I, you know, he he come to the community uh, some years later. He was in and out. He never, you know, hung out with us. Man, he was just in and out visiting from uh, Louisiana. His name was uh, Bruce something, but he just he was just in and out. After the fact, did you have any ill will towards him? At first, I did, but then my. At first, I did, but then my mind went somewhere else. At, to the ones that got me shot. I was more mm. angry with the ones that got me shot and him doing what he did. You know. Okay. So but he was actually, pretty much in the right, just hit the wrong person. The wrong person. But you know, we, we talked, me and him talked. Uh, we ended up we ended up court going to court. We talked and stuff, man, and uh he apologized to me, I accept his apology, sincerely accept his apology. Because if I was in his boot, I probably would have ended up shooting somebody too. So I could be that angry with him. I was more angry with the ones that supposed to be my so called friend who have gotten themselves in a mess and never told me that they had gotten into something. So here you explain this and break this down. It sounds like you're a very well thought person and you're very understanding. You always been like that or life put you to this perspective? I was, uh, I, I, you know what, coming out of kid, I was pretty much 50-50, but a little angry with a lot of things because, you know, being poor, man, you just wonder why us, you know what I'm saying? And, right. you know, mama, she's working hard. She's barely at home at times because she's trying to feed her kids. And uh, just a lot of things that was going on. And so, you know, you you, you know, some some of us, we mature quicker than others. And I was just seeing the, the, the poorness that we were living in, man. And so I had to make a move myself. So I was pretty busy. Even bitter, but I, I end up finding myself doing something about it even then. Even being seven, eight years old, I end up doing something about it. That's when I begin to start finding it, learning, you know, to really steal and take control of my own life. Steal and take control? Stealing, stealing, oh. stealing and taking control of my own life. I had brothers and sisters, you know, that was young. They had to eat, man. We had to, we had to eat. So when you, after you got shot, what you transitioned to after that? Well, it wasn't something that I chose, but um, God, I, I, I went to a revival one night, and uh, I heard this man preaching, man, and for some reason, man, you know, the Spirit of God hit me. <laughs> the Spirit of God hit me, and it, it, it just did some things to me, man, you know. It, it took that part that I couldn't get rid of myself out of me. To make me know that, you know, I was special. Even being poor, you know, let me know I was special. Did you know it was, uh, know it was God at the moment? Yeah. 
I did. I yeah. Did. Well, because uh, when the Spirit of God come up on you, you know it's God. Because when God came up on me, I knew it was God because the Lord, the, the Spirit of God spoke to me. Now, you may find that maybe, are you kidding me? Yes, he did. He did. He did. What was the, the distinctive uh, difference of hearing yourself, think, talk to yourself in your head and hearing God's voice? Because uh, listening, listening to that man preach, that was something I wanted. Because all the people that I've been around coming up, talked about God, went to church, said they were living from God, uh, you know, God this and God that and God this. Well, let, let me back up if it's okay for a minute. I couldn't read, write a spell. And being at the age that I was, I wanted something from this guy that they was talking about. If God was so powerful and he can do this. Well, I went to school for 13 dumb years. Couldn't learn nothing. So I chose to get away from that because I thought that was just a waste of my time. I wasn't learning nothing and they couldn't teach me nothing. So I chose the streets. So the streets became my greatest teacher. But being, being, coming, coming into the knowledge of, of the word of God, this pastor said, if there's anything that anybody wants from God, come up and ask God to bless you. And so when I went up, I said, now if you're the God this man preaching about, I want you to manifest yourself to me. And all I want you to do is just teach me to read. I don't want no new car. I don't want no how. I don't want no money. Just teach me your word. And the Spirit of God taught me. The Spirit of God spoke to me. The Spirit of God called me into the ministry. I didn't go to school for the ministry to God. This, this, this God gave me. God gave it to me. And this is something no teacher could teach me. This is something no man could give to me. Only God gave it to me. And so even though I'm not on my post, but I was called and anointed by God. When God called me into the, into the ministry and, 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 laid, uh, and the Lord laid his, his hand upon me, and this is what God said to me, Go ye therefore teach all nations. In, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And I want you to teach them to observe all things. And I will be with you even until the end of the world. So that wasn't a voice in my head. Another one was a voice of a man. And I knew it was God because I felt the head of God before my head. So the only thing you could read was the Bible? Pretty much the only thing was the Bible. I couldn't read nothing. I couldn't read anything. And wow. the reason why I challenged God is because my oldest daughter challenged me and asked me to read a third grade book at that particular time. And my wife knew I couldn't read, uh, uh, and it hurt me. And this is why I went, I went up that night and asked God to teach me because I was so torn apart. All the years I ran the street uh, 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 putting the game together, those guys didn't know I couldn't read. They didn't know that. Wow. They didn't know, there was a lot of things they just didn't know about me. But my wife knew it. My mother and them, they knew it. Did you purposely keep it from them? I was ashamed of it. I was really actually ashamed of the special age. But a lot of kids who had a, a deformity. And I was there protected because I had my limbs. There was things they just couldn't do. And so when you marked them, you was marking me too. Mm. There was people, who, friends and stuff who I came up with. They knew uh, that, that, uh, that I was especially. And some of them was there. But I'm not going to call the name because that's not important to, to, to me. That, that's just not important to me. All I know, God is capable uh, of doing anything for anybody that, that was in the position that I was in. Can you tell us about? Can you tell us about that moment you was attempting to read, and then began to read? Um, my wife came home from work one day, and I was uh, going through some stuff with the Lord, asking questions, questioning God, challenging God, and when she came home, I asked my wife. I asked my wife to come here and I wanted her to watch me read the Bible. And I asked her, I said, am I saying this right? She said, keep on going. And she says, uh, just keep on going. She said, yeah, you read. And that's when I broke down in tears and started crying. She said, read some more. Just just, just read some more. for." Her. And so I started reading and reading and reading. And then I know then God had to deliver this package. What's your wife's name? My wife's name is Vonnie Williams. Hey, Amen. Yeah. Mm. That's what I know. And I also read one thing in there that was very important to me that I shared with people who can't read. You know, uh, don't feel bad because God wrote a path of a script in the Bible where he said he chose the foolish thing to confirm to the wise people 
that you know what? I can do I can do what I will. And I can do it how I want to do it with these people. Mm -hmm. So we're not we're not being put to the side. Mm -mm. So did you accept that calling at that time? Yeah. Yeah, I accept my calling and everything. You remember what scripture you read? Um actually I was over in the book of Jeremiah and I got so excited I was just all over the Bible because of the church was having a Bible drill. So I'm, I was pretty much when I read it, I was just all over the thing because I was nervous. You know, just nervous. Just running through the Bible like a kid in a candy store. You remember the first time you read out loud to other people outside of your uh, family? Yeah. Was yeah. you nervous? I was nervous. I was nervous. I was nervous. Uh, I, just, I had butterflies. I mean, just knowing the guy that called me, I didn't know if people would believe me. Because you know my past and this and that, but you know I, I you know I had talked to my uh, daddy and I had talked to my father about it, and uh, but there was someone who had seen that vision of me ministering, but they never told me I was called to preach. God Himself laid the anointing, I put His anointing upon me. You said something that just made me think of something. Do you think you have fully healed from your past? Well, no, because I walked, I, I walked away from my post from God. And when you do that, what you do, you fall back into a world of sin. And that's what, we, what, what God called it being disobedient. I have a mission uh, that God had called me to be on. And I feel, I'm, I'm, feeling, I'm feeling God. I'm feeling myself short of it. So I need to get back on my post. And I'm not in the not about it. I think this is why God put uh, repentance back, we put repentance in the Bible so that we can come back to the fold and get back on the, I call it the art of safety. Now, people call it going to church and being in church, but I call it the art of safety. Mm -hmm. What was, if you want to talk about it, what was the situation that made you walk away from your post? It was a lot of things, but one thing uh, pretty much I fell short of uh Doing what God told us to do, and most people don't do this. Most people don't do what God tells them to do, and they don't see the, the shortfall. I feel short because when Jesus came preaching the word of God, in order for us to stay strong in God, we have to read to feed, the, to feed our soul and spirit. We have to fast to keep the soul and spirit strong, and these are the things that we have to do in order to stay strong in God. And if we fail to do these things, I'm going to tell you right now, you're going to mm -hmm. end up back in the hall pen. Now, 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 listen to this and listen to, listen to me real close. See, you may get offended by, be called, by people calling you an animal. The word of God calls you a dog when you go back and eat your own, eat your own vomit. And mm -hmm. so that's what I mean. I, I'm, I'm a dog just, just in my own vomit and stuff, and I acknowledge it. Because uh, and so yeah. now I can pretty much beat anybody in dog though. So. Oh yeah, so so you the king around here, huh? Pretty much, man. People, you know, they they, they you know they got themselves ranked where they where they want to be. At. I, I'm fine with. It. I'm gonna stand as the one and only king in Domino. 